I would like to uh, leave the floor uh, to you for your introduction uh, and thank you for being uh, with us here today again. Thank you very much, Mehmet. I'm very excited to be here with all of the entrepreneurs. Firstly, congratulations to those of you who have made it to the SDG Impact Accelerator. I'm very excited about meeting each one of you individually um, and learn more. But for today, we will uh, discuss a few things that are very close to my heart as a VC and uh, have been in your shoes. So so without further ado, a little bit on my introduction, uh, just one minute. I'm a tech professional by background. I lived 20 years in Silicon Valley and worked for tech companies, moved back to Bangladesh. I've worked in companies like um, Dell and Microsoft. And then two years ago, I decided to follow my passion, which is uh, venture capital. So I have my own fund. At the moment, we, uh, we have 38 startups in our portfolio and we're opening uh, funding uh, in Q4 for new startups. Our, we are impact driven, we like SDG and we definitely like ESG. So we'll share more about that. And without further ado, let me take you to the topic of today's discussion. Can you all see my screen? Yes, yeah. Perfect. So uh, the topic today is impact techpreneurs driving change. And um, why do I use the word techpreneur? It's because all of you are aware that technology is, is an enabler, but what technology allows all of us to do today, especially after COVID, is the digital accelerated transformation that has happened. Technology allows us to scale. So it's very important to have an important uh, technology component in your startups because whatever you do, if you cannot scale, it's very hard to, to grow. So uh, firstly, it's just that we would like to say, um, is your business a VC case? As a startup, most of you are now going to be getting funded and you will continue your journey. So what is a startup? This is something that we really think all of us should be aligned. Um, just uh, the first thing that a startup does is what we look for is you have to have an innovative idea. You cannot be digitizing something that is automated and call yourself a startup because there's no innovation there. There's just, it's just called automating, right? And then you have, besides being innovative, you have to create value. The reason we look for that is because you are now as a startup going to sell something to the consumers. Um, most startups come to us with very sophisticated solutions and we say, what are we doing? Saying, Mr. Problem, please come and find me. That's not a startup. A startup solves problems. So it creates values. A startup is innovative. A startup must be very ambitious. If you are a niche market player, you will never grow and you will never scale. It's very, very important to say that we will Sorry, I think there's an echo. It's very important to say that you would, you have to have the market. And the other thing that I've talked about, you know, the scalability, um, a startup will work in an uncertain environment because you're creating a market. You do not have a ready market. You are value creators. You're going to find a new customer base. You're going to offer something to someone that hasn't been offered before because you're innovative. And that's when you are a startup because you're working in uncertain territory. And last but not least, a startup must have an exit strategy. I have yet to come ac across a successful startup that says, um, I will do this all by myself. I will grow by myself. You can never do that. You have to have exit. Now, exit could be partial. Exit could be a complete acquisition. That There are different ranges, but a startup definitely looks for that. So the first thing is, if you were um, approaching me and I was going to talk to you as a VC, I would look for these six things in your presentation. Where is your innovation? What value are you creating? How ambitious are you? What is your target market? Are you a niche market player? Can you scale? Do you have the technology to take you from 100 users to a million users in a month? What is, what is your market looking like? It, it should be uncertain. If you, have a, if you tell me it's perfect case, then you're not a startup. And your exit strategy. So that was the first thing that we look at as, um, you know, when we come and talk to you. As we move forward, what do VCs look for? If you are going to be an impact tech premier, you're, there's three other things that are important. Some are going to be repeated from the six, but the first thing is go big or go home. We tell the startups that, that if you are not, especially those who are looking for a market like Bangladesh, 160 million people, if you cannot solve a problem for the masses, you're not an impact startup, right? Because impact says you make a difference. So 
you have to be big. If you say I have a niche product and I think I will have a million customers max, then we say, please go home because we're looking for startups that can solve for millions of people, tens and twenties, 50 million, 60 million. So that means there is a gap there. Then the other thing is big win that you have a huge addressable market similar to what the what is saying that you have Bangladesh. So if you are a fintech player, if you are an edutech player, if you are a health tech player, if you're agri tech player, if your services, you are serving the masses because you've got the population that can buy from you. So that's the market size. And a simple math that we tell all startups is 160 million people, a dollar per person per quarter. That's your half a billion dollar revenue right away. Think along those lines, right? Scalability is very important and we've talked about it. So some of the things I won't spend too much time, um, can you replicate across markets? So scalability doesn't only mean local. You are now in SDG impact accelerator program, which can take you to the other markets. How quickly can you plug and play your solution in a neighboring market? Because we're South Asia emerging, very similar customer psyche, very similar customer buying pattern, very similar technology adoption curve. Can we take you from country A to country B very quickly? Are you ready for that scale? And then, you know, can you grow expon exponentially when your marginal cost is diminishing? So these are things that we look at, right? Um, and the last thing is besides market size and scalability is what is your unique value proposition? Are, there will be competitors. If you don't have competitors, that means you're not doing something right. There will be, but what is, your value proposition? Why are you better than the incumbents? And there are multiple ways to answer that. We'll get to that when, like, what are we looking for? And I'll share my experience. But you must have a technology advantage because technology is, I, I cannot repeat myself enough more. And most of you may think I'm biased towards technology. Yes, I am, because technology is a very important play here. So please invest in your tech stack very diligently. Somehow some startups we have seen are just not paying attention to the tech part. They're paying attention to the business part. But remember, the technology is always under underwriting your business. So you make sure the technology follows your business. Otherwise, you will be stuck. There will be a dead end. Do you have customer love? What does customer love mean that means a customer it, it once they have your product they will keep coming back to you and it's because you've solved a problem of the customer and the network effect of the platform is when you look at your product how much are you going to be able to cross sell upscale and move forward i will continue all the slides and then at the end we'll we'll, we'll have question and answers there's two other things that we look at when you are a startup and you are going to say okay we are ready to fund and when i'll be talking to most of you um, with the intent of looking at you very seriously as a vc which we will schedule later with sdgia these are things that i will ask you so you have a you have an advantage that i'm telling you what to have in your slide deck for at least for us as a vc is there a founder market fit i'm i'm not sure how many of you've heard this term but these are very important that you know there are two factors we test what is your idea and who are the people behind it? To us, it's very, very important that the founder is aligned with the business idea and with the market. Does the market, uh, is there a need for what the founder is thinking that there is a need for? We test that, we test that very diligently. So besides founder mar market fit, we also look at the product market fit. It's, it's a very compelling value hypothesis, right? That what is in your product and your feature, who is your customer or your audience, and what is your business model? How are you going to position your product? How are you going to price your product? Um, there's all of these things that look into it. So when a founder comes to us, we don't expect the founder to have solved for world hunger. Nobody can. But in your mind, the algorithm that you have to sell to a VC has to be linked to all of these things, because these are steps that take you to the final close where you know you have a handshake with the VC saying, I want to back you, I want to be behind you, your success is my success. And that's what the game is, right? So we want to be aligned in the thinking saying, okay, the market is, is the king here. So we need to fit everything according to the market, right? The founder must have a very good understanding of the market and so does the product. It's very important for the product to be completely fit with the market needs. 
Um, another thing that is very important as you approach VCs is don't just go in and when you hear of any VC, so there's lots of VCs that you will be approaching, right? When you hear of any VC, don't just send your pitch deck. Remember, your pitch deck is a living, breathing document. It changes daily um, because you're learning new things, you're hearing new things, you're absorbing new things. If I have been able to change something in your deck today, then this talk has been successful because you, we've opened a little bit more windows in your brain to think differently and, and attach some more value to your deck. So doing the homework on the VC is very important because each VC has their own investment thesis. So for us, our investment thesis is solve the problems of the masses in the unmet and unarticulated needs of the masses. So what we're saying is that as a VC, what we're saying is that customers are not sophisticated enough to articulate what their problem is. But we, as a product market fit, founder market fit, must know what the customer's problem is before the customer even can speak about the problem. That's the unmet and unarticulated need. And masses is because we've got 160 million people, technology is pretty nascent, services are not digital yet. We think there's a huge play. Bangladesh as a country is doing very, very well right now. The next three to five years of the journey of each of you in the startup is going to be phenomenal. We, we don't know what success will look like, but we know that it's going to be a game changer. So you, each of you could not have been in a better time than now to launch your startup. SDGIA Impact Accelerator has chosen the best time to pick each of you and take you forward. And we are very excited to be part of that journey. And then, so in, as you do your homework, the investment thesis is look at the geography and markets. As a VC, we are interested in Bangladesh and emerging um, South Asian nations. So emerging means Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, and these kind of countries, right? So do your th in homework on what is the investment thesis of the VC you are approaching? What industries does the VC look at? SVK Tech looks at agri-tech, fintech, health tech, edu-tech, and any other services. Then we look at the technology of the I'm sorry. You're good. Okay. Thank you. And then the last thing in your investment thesis is please do homework on your VC. What stage of the startup does the VC fund? You may have everything aligned with the VC, but the stage is important. So we are called, we are early stage VC. So that means we look at startups that are at, at your stage and pre-series A or series A. There are a lot of VCs that only look at series B. That means you've already got your product, you're monetizing, you're making profit. Now you need money to scale. So the, those kind of VCs don't have the appetite to test the market with you, which we do. We're saying we are going to be ecosystem builders where we see a good idea idea we're going to bet on that idea and take it to market and, and see how it grows so look at the vc type and the stage of the startup they're funding adjust your pitch deck according to that uh, the type of deals and the deal size you must know vcs usually tell them you know what kind of valuation what kind of what is their ticket size what is the valuation they're looking for we know a lot of vcs who say three million dollars and below is the valuation of the startup that we fund. Anything over $3 million, we do not fund. So these are things you will have to find out. Some things are not really written on, on the website. So it's very important, a tip I'll give you that if you can have a conversation with the VC before you send your pitch deck, it's very valuable because these are the questions you will ask, which nobody will teach you saying, what is your typical um, deal size? What kind of ownership do you want? What is the value, max valuation? And these will not be on the website. These are when you get the one-on-one -on -one or the networking sessions, take notes, understand, have your um, you know, strategy ready for each kind of VC. And the other very important thing is that um, you know, it's a partnership model. When you come into with the work with the VC, there is a partnership model. Some VCs are very, very hands-on and some are like, you know, here's your money. Let me know how you do every quarter sink or swim, I'm okay either way. And the others are like, I wanna know what's happening. So we're kind of a hands-on VC. We look very carefully at what the startup is doing. We have a dashboard that we have the startups fill the data and we track that dashboard through, through technology and see what's the, what's the value. The reputation and last but not least, it's very, very important to have a VC that supports you and you enjoy working with them. This is a partnership. It's kind of like a marriage. It's very important that you gel or you align and you work together. 
Um, so one of the things that we've had interesting conversations with startups is that you need funding, right? We all understand that. But what happens once you have that funding? What else do you need besides investment from a VC? It's not only about money, right? Because when you grow, you understand that you will have multiple raising rounds. So the downstream investment, what value add does the VC give to you? I'm, my wish for each of you is that you will have multiple VCs interested in you. So you can choose and that's when you will decide that, you know, VC A versus VC B, what, do, what value do I get from the VC? It, are they very connected? Are they ecosystem builders? Do they take risks? What is their investment appetite? Do they do follow on funding? Do they have the ability to do that? And, and what, how have their current portfolios performed? How talk to founders of those current portfolios and get some insight on the VC, get some intel. With these are very important to do your homework. I know that when you are a, I've been a founder and entrepreneur before, we just think that, oh my God, if I get my first check, I'm, I'm through, but you know, take a step back. If it takes two months longer, let it take two months longer because this is a journey for a good part of your life where you will want to make the right decision and partner with the right VC. So it's it, every time a startup comes and interviews with us, we tell them that this is not a one-way interview. It's a two-way interview, right? We are interviewing the startups, but the startups also must interview the VC because you also have needs. You, we, we want to be a two-way relationship where we say we want to be funding you and you say, yes, I want you to fund me. So it's a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. So in, from the beginning, please remember it's teamwork, it's partnership, and the VC you choose must take you successfully through your multiple rounds or what we call downstream investment. Um, that's one that we've said what you need besides um, uh, funding. And then very related is the business connections, right? So funding is only one part of success for a startup. You may have all, you may have received a lot of funding and you're based on your business model. You've said, this is the model. It's, it's innovative. So it's not tested before. It's got a great, it looks great on paper. It looks great on, on, on numbers, but, but let's test it, right? Then you need to have deals with the business community because as a startup, either you are a B2C, which is business to consumer or a B2B, which is business to business. But the selling part, when it comes in for you to make money, someone is going to pay you money, right? In order to work on that someone, your VC should have the ability to make that market connection for you or help you with that connection saying, look, I'm VC A, I've backed startup B, and let's go and meet company C, D, and E to go together and test the market and say, you know, company C, this is us. We have something that may help. Let's, can we have a business deal here? So imagine that that's what you will need once you've locked the investments. When you're, when you're looking for a VC and when you've got your investment, please talk about this, that can you connect me to the market? Are you interested? Are you connected? Does the market know you as a VC? Does the market respect you as a VC? Can we tap on you to say, can we go into the network of the business connections, which is very different from the funding? This slide is actually my favorite, favorite slide. And I think um, after our session today, all of you will have nailed this because this I'm sharing with you and I'm sure other VCs you talk to have asked you this question, why you, why now? And why is your solution better than someone else's? And if you can read through this in the why now, the most important thing is what has changed. Why is your idea so important now and, and it has never been before. So there must, if it was very important all along and you're the only one who has come up with it now, there's something wrong, right? Because something must have changed the trigger. What is the trigger? Is it a regulatory change? Is it a change in customer behavior? And you know, all of these things that are listed here, what is the trigger that has happened for you to answer the question to a VC, why now? All of you who are listening have your solutions, right? Ask yourself, why now? And it, and it shouldn't be, oh, because I saw this uh, competition in SDGIA and I, I thought I, I, I'll apply. That's not a compelling answer, right? So you're, it's some deep thinking needs to go into this part of the slide because this is where you will get the 
the VC interested, saying, you know, what is it that has changed that you have said this idea will work? And re remember, every startup pivots. So you start with one idea and then the market is a, is, is a beast, right? It changes on you all the time. Keep moving with the market so that you have product market fit. Don't be so hung up on your idea that you are not going to move. You need to move. You have to be nimble. That's why you're a startup and not a billion dollar conglomerate. You, you're nimble, you have a small team. You can chase the market as the market changes faces, you move along and then that's your trigger and that's how you answer why now. So you can say that this is what, what was happening. And, and, and so this is something you need to think about. This is nobody puts it on the slide. But this is a question we ask you, not even in an interview form. It's like when I'm chatting with you, you won't even realize that this is what, what is being asked. So please keep this at the back of your mind. No one has a slide on this. No one even expects to answer this seriously, but this is a very serious question. And, and why you is, you know, is important because you never bet on the idea. A, a VC doesn't bet on the company. A VC doesn't bet on the idea, a VC that's on the person. It's the founder. And I'll share a personal story with you. When I was working in Silicon Valley, I was working for a venture capital and I was, I was very young. It was my first or second job. And I was sitting there and, and, you know, the startups would come for the pitch, the VC and the team would listen. I was one of them. And then some of the main, the main decision maker would, would see the person walk in and say, why or no. And it, I was so intrigued that you haven't even heard his idea. You haven't even heard what the business is. How can you bet on this startup just by seeing the person walk in? And, and the answer that was given to me because he was a very seasoned Silicon Valley VC. He said, I can look at that person and see that is he resilient and is he persistent? Two things, right? So when you're resilient, you don't give up. You give up on giving up. You keep chasing your dream. And you know, when you're persistent, that's what it is. And when you're resilient, every time you fall, you rise higher after each fall. No one keeps you down. So these are things that we look at in founders. It's like you, your idea, when we fund you till the time you make it may have changed multiple times. And we may have been part of that change together, but you cannot change. The common denominator here is the founder. The founder has to have the persistence and the resilience to go take the market and knock it down. And that's what a VC looks for. So when we say, why you, that's your answer. It's like, I know I will be successful. I know this is a market need. I know I can solve the problem. These are things um, that you are looking for. And the last but not least, um, it, it's, it's an important point that it has to be a requirement. So you, when you're an impact accelerator startup, you are, your product must not be a nice to have. It's a must have or a need to have because nice to have kind of goes into discretionary spending. And that's where, where you don't control the game. You want to be in track to say, I'm here to make a difference for the masses. I I want to, I, I have, I'm innovative and I can create value. So the, your product must have all of those. And remember, um, we see a lot of startups that have the most sophisticated solutions and I'm repeating myself, but they come and say, we have a very sophisticated solution, but there are no takers. You don't be a startup that says, Mr. Problem, please come and find me. Find the problem. That's your, that's the success for any startup. Um, another part, this I think all of you know, I will not spend too much of the time here. You must know your numbers. Many times we've had startups come to us and they fumble and they look at their notes. You cannot look at your notes on this slide. It needs to be in your brain. You must know your numbers. I cannot emphasize this more. What is the market? What is the TAM, the total available market? the service available market, share of the market, what is traction, where are you now, what are your plans, you know, and the round. So know your numbers and, and know it at the, top, at the tips of your fingertip. It should be at the tip of your fingers, right? Saying, I know what it is, no fudging time, because this tells us how prepared you are. I won't spend too much time here, but I think um, all of you know this part. And I'm, we're coming towards the end of the discussion where we're saying, okay, let's say we've had one or two meetings. We really like your idea. We, we like you. We want to invest in you, but we've said 
let's do some due diligence. Every VC has a due diligence process. And what is a due diligence process? We investigate a startup to say, let's go in deeper and see our, what, are, what they're saying on PowerPoint, how can they validate it with everything else? So the question is, what do investors look at? We look at everything. So legal, financial, technical, we also do references on the founder, try to understand who he is, uh, reference checks, background checks, everything, right? And then please remember, can due diligence kill a deal? The answer is yes. There's a lot of startups we've worked with that haven't made it because of due diligence. They, you know, having a very impressive PowerPoint is not that hard. You can get hold of people who will, who will make a very good PowerPoint for you, but then translate that into numbers, into Excel, into financial projections, into five-year projections, translate that into legal, translate that into a technical. How do you hold that value? Justify everything because what we're here for saying that we like what you're saying, prove it to us that you can do this. And the other thing I cannot emphasize enough is that trust is a very important thing in this relationship. Please, please be completely honest. If you've made a mistake, tell the VC you've made a mistake. We respect honesty and we understand that we are all humans. It is okay to make a mistake. It is okay to have a wrong calculation in your Excel sheet. It is not okay to think I'm a fool or any VC is a fool and, and justify that and take us around and around and around. It doesn't work. Don't waste your time. Don't waste the VC's time. If at any stage of due diligence, you think there's been a mistake, own it. It's okay to make mistakes. You are not, you are a startup. You're not expected to know everything, but you are expected to be honest because the relationship begins with trust. Um, a very important thing here is before due diligence. Um, one of the things we highly recommend is um, you know keep your VDR. I don't know how many of you know what a VDR is, but that is what, the way it is going. It's a virtual data room. You can build your own. You can have paid models where you go to because you know going sending files back and forth is not very professional, right? We are all now leveraging technology to manage our time better, to be more productive and efficient. So a virtual data room is like a shared folder where you park all the documents that is requested from you and the VC will go in there and check. And, and then you don't let it, in order to download it, we need you, you give some access control because we see a lot of emails flying, your, your PowerPoint may be shared with somebody else it, intentionally or unintentionally, it's not very nice, we understand that. So we say, you know, you show some, some preparedness on your part when you send me a deck, I would like to see it in a shared, and Google Drive is free. Send it in a Google Drive with restrictions, which makes me take the effort to actually go in, put in my name and e email address and, and look at your slide. And you can track how many people have looked at your slide. So be prepared at your end to say, you know, I'm on top of my game. I, I don't want to send my deck to everybody. I choose to send to you. Please respect that and, and share your credentials with me so I know you've seen it. That's a very strong message. Um, to be organized and uh, you know, be very organized, you, when I go into your shared data room, I wanna see a good thought process, right? So there's a table of contents, it has your PowerPoint, it has your CVs, it has your business uh, links, if any hyperlinks. So just be organized and, and treat, uh, treat it in, with everybody with respect so that when they go in, they don't have to ask you questions. The idea is when you have a shared folder, there should be no need for a VC to ask you any questions. Right? So just make sure that it's very organized. And lastly, every VC will want to speak with your shareholders, with your employees and other investors. And if you were employed before your employers, make sure you talk to them and brief them when you are giving a reference. We've had instances where, where um, you know, we've done some reference checks and, and the person had nothing good to say. Don't just do this for the sake of doing it. When, you, when a VC asks you for a reference check, take that seriously. Talk to that person before. If that person is not going to give you a good reference, do not use him or her as your referee. That, that kills the deal. Um, some diligence uh, checklists, just to give you a due diligence checklist, uh, it's not exhaustive and you can read here, is um, you know, your, what is your competitive advantage? That is why you, why now? Who are your competitors? We will ask you this and you need to know that. I shouldn't be telling a startup 
as a VC who his or her competitor is. So please know that. What is your go-to-market strategy and your customer acquisition plan? What are your tech um, you know, partners? What is their activities? What are the sales contracts you have? And, and last, what we really look at, which, which is something you may have may know or may not have known, is who were your key clients and, and why are they not your clients now if they were if they're not on the list initially? So that, that's when a VC, remember a VC's job is to go and find out that is everything okay with the startup? So why did a client cancel the contract? What was the reason? Was, was there something, is there a red flag? Is, is there something I need to be aware of? So these are the things that happen in due diligence. Um, how am I doing on time? Uh, it's fine, Sonia. It's going okay. pretty well. So. Okay, thank you. I won't take too much more. Um, so when I said, uh, we talked about due diligence, so there are two parts of the due diligence, right? The, if you see that the previous slide that I talked about, was a due diligence checklist for business right and then there is a due that because we are we are sbk tech ventures we look at technology we believe that technology is the enabler that helps you scale and it's very important for us to look at a, the due diligence checklist for you so these are the things we will look at and again this list is not exhaustive but just to give you an idea that is are you in-house or outsourced do you have a third party doing your technology stack or do you have a team inside that is building the technology for you? Um, what is the architectural schema or who the chief architect will be able to tell us the org you understand? Are there any third parties involved? And what is their involvement? What is your data security and disaster management plan, the access controls protocol? And, and one of the things that we, we want to really highlight here, which is not in the checklist, but I will tell you, those of who understand technology, that there's a so a lot of software out there that is free, right? When you say PHP, um, so what we're saying is your software needs to at some point be proprietary. It needs to be your own IP or intellectual property unless you have outsourced it to a very strong company. As you are all starting your journey, we do understand that you want, you have, you know, you don't have infinite amounts of dollars to invest in a proprietary software, but please keep that in your mind. We, at some point, you will, as you grow and you scale and your idea becomes, uh, you know, becomes a big part of a big business plan, please, play, play, uh, please put focus, emphasis on your technology stack because we will look at that. In order to go from 100 users to million users overnight, what does it take? And do you have it in your roadmap? You don't have to have it now. We totally understand that, but you must be prepared because you know it will be very. It will be a very sorry state. Is you have the market ready, you have takers, but you can't support it because you know most things fail because of the technology. So that's a very very important thing that we will be looking at uh, when we do your tech um, due diligence. We talked about the virtual data room, and just to give you a little bit of an idea, what what it does and what so. You know, it does save time because we're not going back and forth on email and losing, and then I have to download the file, save it in a folder, and, and you also have to keep track of who you email to. There, um, But the access control is very important because your documents, please treat your PowerPoint and your business plan, Excel sheets, whatever you use, very confidential. It is important that you protect yourself. I've seen templates flying all across the board. We've seen a lot of things happen. Um, and I would like to warn you that it's important to control your access. Only give access to people you want to give access to. And let and that's when we see, and we respect when we see that. And the other thing is that, um, you know, what the VDR does for you as a startup is it gives you a lot of insight. So let's say you mail your PowerPoint to 20 VCs who, who who you've shortlisted, you will know how many of them have gone and checked which file and have, have seen which file. Uh, so then you know that if a VC is interested in you, you will see multiple hits on your site. It's important for you to know that, right? So at the end of the, every week, let's say you have a list of saying, these are the VCs I want to reach out to. I've reached out to them in LinkedIn. I've gotten their email address. I have their phone number. And now I've sent them my VDR access. How many are downloading your files? If none are downloading your files, knock those 20 off. They're not interested. If two have, follow through with them. If three have only done a little bit and then they've stopped, ping them again. But it's really 
important to know who is really interested in you because you know it as i said it's a two way street so please this this is what a vdr or a virtual data room allows you to do it gives you insight that you wouldn't have if you had just sent a blanket email this is a very famous um, uh, person, obviously, most of you know Abe Lincoln. Uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes is like, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. Um, the planning and the strategy is much more important than the execution. Yes, I've also heard a counter phrase which says, um, vision without ex uh, execution is hallucination. Totally agree with that as well. But just don't go and test first. Plan. Plans may change. Plans may fail. But it's very important to go through that process. And for so this is what it's saying is that when you have an idea, please do a lot of deep reflection and deep thinking and talk to as many people as you can. And we will open up our offices for each one of you to come and just discuss with us so that we can help you plan for what you're going to go to market with. This is just a little bit of a tip, um, you know, be patient, it takes time. Um, it's, uh, we, we, we're all very busy and it's, it's important not to push very hard. Um, it's important to understand that there is that this is a long process. It's never a quick process. So those of you who are in the fundraising right now, you will not get funded next week or next month. It's a process. So please keep that in mind. Be realistic. It's very important to be realistic. And, and remember that you will never meet all the criteria. No one ever does. Let me share with you. There's not a single startup that we have funded out of the 38 that have met all the criteria and you're not expected to. Because we have this whole list that we're gonna come after, right? And we're, we understand it's human, but our list is exhaustive based on multiple things we've learned. It may not be applicable to you. So just focus on what you do well and address that. It's completely okay to say, I don't, no, or I don't have it. It's not okay to make up something. It really isn't. Nobody is a fool here, neither are you, neither are the VCs. So let's respect each other's intellectual ability to process information and, and move forward with it with a with a trust. And lastly, it's very it's much more appreciated if you under promise and over deliver. It's it's say less and do more. Um, I cannot emphasize that. Another thing, if we can give you some tips, is um, the do's and don'ts with the investors. When you're, when you're fundraising, you want the investor to like you. You want the investor to say, I want to work with this person. Uh, sometimes we have seen that uh, people just don't understand that, and they think that you know, being, being very impressive, that they are being impressive, but it's not. So here are the do's. Just be accurate, brief, and clear. We call it ABCs. Make succinct points. What do you do? What makes you special? You must have a something called an elevator pitch. That imagine if you are riding in the elevator with the with the VC, you have about two to three minutes. In that two to three minutes, what would you say to get me interested to talk to you? To get any VC interested to talk to you? So be very brief and have it ready, right? Um, please never send a PowerPoint as a PPT extension use a PDF because it's not editable, or at least it takes effort to edit that. It tells us a lot from a technology perspective about a startup when they send us a PPT versus a P PDF. And these are, you, you can see the list, I don't wanna go there, but um, uh, in the don'ts, the one of my favorite pet peeves, I don't know if that makes sense, is please never use a personal email address. It is, it is not respectful. When you have a startup and you've taken it seriously, invest in getting a, an email address with your domain. It says a lot about you as a person. You, it says you believe long term in what you're doing will be successful. And a lot of us, tell, a lot of startups tell us that we we use uh, because we're not funded. We don't know if this will go through. That tells us a lot. That says oh, that's how much you are persistent. That's your resilience on your idea. Bet on yourself. Bet on your idea. Get an email address. That says if your product is called tech, it must be tech.com, your email domain. I'm just recapping here. Um, what do we look for in a startup? There's eight things. We check these boxes, the founder, the product market fit, 
what is your impact story? And if you're an SDG, IA impact in that accelerator, you have that, your fundraising history, are you viable, your technology, your intellectual property? And the last thing that we haven't talked about, which I'll say is your cap table. Cap table means, let's say you're all, you have just started, who are the founders and how much share do they have? And, and we want to see, we do not want to see a single founder ever because you, you know, it's, it's very risky to invest in a startup with a single founder. It's a single point of failure, right? So you must have at least two founders. And then what we also like to see is the ratio of, of equity between the two founders is, is, is like 60, 40, 90, 10 is a no for us because 10% and 90% is, is not very equitable. We definitely want to see as you grow, we want to see good names in there, individual versus institutional names that are respectful, that are, um, you know, in this business, it's very important to be ethical. So that's why we look at the cap table very seriously. So remember, I know you're all chasing money, but please choose carefully. It's your choice as well. It matters what choice you make, because in the long run, it, people will look at who you took as an investor. And it's very important for all people like those of us who raise foreign funding, you know, we have compliance checks ourselves. So we, we want to make sure we're always associated with the with the good people, the clean people. And I would respect that um, all startups here will do the same um, and, you know, get people if it's individual when you're starting. So remember, single founder, not attractive equity between two founders, 90, 10, 80, 20, not attractive, 70, 30, maybe we'll make an exception, 60, 40, we can talk. And then the more you go better, gender lens investing, please have someone female and don't just, you know, I've seen some founders who put their wives names in and they never come to it. So that's fooling us. So let's not fool each other, begin with trust. If you don't have a female founder, tell us you don't. We understand that it's a challenge we all face, we'll work around it. So the cap table story tells us a lot about you as a startup. And that's actually all I have. So um, with that, I'd like to, hand it over and see how we're doing and for a question and answer session. Thank you, Sonia, very much for the very practical uh, tips. And we're fine on timing. Uh, so we have plenty of time for uh, questions from our founders. So um, whoever wants to go, please go ahead. And then um, uh, if you, in the meanwhile, want to write on chat as well your questions, that's fine. We can go back there and, and take a look. Are you are you investing in startups outside of Bangladesh, Sonia, at this time? Um, yes, we are, but it depends. So we, you know, how we've defined ourselves as an emerging South Asia fund. So it will be startups that are in in this belt of the region, but they may be domiciled in any part of the world as long as they are addressing uh, their solution is is in this part. Great, thank you. I have a question. Also, um, we were fundraising. Um, and we succeeded and we talked to about 50 investors and we read through all the different uh, like criteria and so on. Um, and it was for me, I found like in the end, the investor was very closely related to us. Like uh, we knew quite well and so on. And that's why he invested. So for the criteria for me, it looks like everyone puts them out. But from my experience in the end, it's that you're really close related to the investor so that he can or she can trust you. Um, so it's like, I never see this on the criteria, but I think that's actually how it is. So, I'm, so I would be interested if you would confirm or uh, say, no, that's maybe that was just your experience. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. No, that, that's an, uh, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm intrigued by your comment actually, because um, for SBK Tech Ventures, the ones we funded, I, I think 99% I am, we have no relationship. I didn't know them before they came for the pitch. So there was no connection at all. Yeah. Okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I had a quick question, Sonia. This is uh, Shadman. Hope you guys can hear me. Yes, we um, can. Thank you. Uh, great listening to you as, as always. Um, I had a few specific questions and uh, just a quick introduction. I'm one of the co-founders of Shatin Fintech. We're doing peer-to-peer -peer lending in Bangladesh. We're starting that. Um, as we think about building technology versus outsourcing, the point that you made, obviously there's a lot of technology we need to build, but then there's other technology, whether it be natural language processing or artificial intelligence or OCR uh, to pick up, let's say, a text from 
bank statements or whatever that may be. A lot of these technology are very advanced for a startup to start developing these and hiring people who have machine learning background in Bangladesh is quite a bit of a challenge. So how do you guys, or how should we think about it? Uh, one, outsourcing, but then working with an external partner who has an industry expert, but then how do we then transition to owning it on our own, which becomes very capital intensive? How do we balance that? Yeah, that's actually um, a very good question. And you're absolutely right. In Bangladesh, you know, our tech talent is, is, is not there yet. We don't have a lot of very good uh, people because in, you know, it's not because we haven't invested. It's just that because in Bangladesh, the academia, the industry and technology, there's a bit of a gap. So uh, there's something we recommend for, for our startups that are in our ecosystem. A lot of them we've made them do is go look outside Bangladesh for people who can help you, right? And there's a right. lot of people in, in, in parts of the world that is like Eastern Europe probably, like we've, we've had yeah. startups that have had luck with, with finding someone and you know they were cheaper than Bangladesh, but you need someone who understands that technology and then you have a train the trainer kind of module, right? So please right. look outside, get a little bit of that help you need to build your product and and don't and we don't expect you to spend a lot of money right that i mean that that's not a startup's game so please i would say and we're happy to help you with that because what we're as svk tech ventures we're actually working on building a platform for tech startups to come to us and ask and, and you know when they had need help we should be able to connect with them with people who can say you know for maybe a month or two months get this solved build locally and then train and and, and expand so I'll be happy to work with you on that. Would love to get in touch with you on that. I guess the other piece is like, what about working with someone externally as a vendor for certain specific aspects? Like, what are your thoughts about that? And how does that impact our startups, um, I guess, readiness to ventures like yourselves? Would you look at it as a negative way that, okay, you guys have this tech, but then like the machine learning piece or the natural language processing piece, you guys don't have it on your own. So I'm a bit nervous. Like, how do you guys look look at? So that's the beauty, right? At a startup stage, we understand that you will not have everything as your own IP, right? And you also need a lot of money to build your own team. We totally get it. But what we're interested in seeing is that if you do have outside third party, that's why in our due diligence, we asked, do you have third party contractor right. or relationships? It's completely okay because your intent is what matters. Your intent is to get that technology as part of your solution, right? And that's what we're looking for. So don't worry if it is not your own. We don't expect you to have a big IT team initially. It's not realistic, right? So that's completely okay. Don't worry about that. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Appa. This is Vipasha. Um, I know. I know. Uh, I, I met you. Some. Um, um, so uh, Ami, uh, I'm here uh, representing uh, Shujo, which is a product of iSocial. I'm sure you've heard of uh, Dr. Anu Nuraihan, and I'm sure you know him very well. Yes. So um, Sh Shujo is, is a platform of um, iSocial, and we work completely at the bottom of the pyramid where we are trying to um, uh, serve the underserved population with essential products and services. Um, um, it could be FMCG products, it could be health products, sexual reproductive health, um, women, childcare. Um, so there's a whole range of that. And through that, we try to address the um, issue of providing them with decent earning opportunities and um, bridging the digital divide and bringing them into the financial bracket. And through that, we generate the data that we generate. We try to uh, serve the B2B population, um, corporates, government and um, other organizations. So in a nutshell, that's, that's what we are trying to do. Um, my question to you was in terms of uh, you, you were mentioning about having the tech stack versus the business planning versus the execution as well. So um, I, I, I know uh, in this, uh, um, uh, you were just talking to Shadman about uh, how, how technology is not up to par in Bangladesh. But uh, my question to you is if we are focusing or, or something that I'm facing right now is how much do you focus on the tech versus how much do you, because it's, it, for us, it's a very completely innovative uh, place we're going into. We are trying to sell services. We're trying to make entrepreneurs out of people who earn maybe five to 15,000 a month. So they're, they're going to be our micro entrepreneurs. They're going to start using digital you know, tablets or phones. Um, so 
one is focusing on the tech part versus the business. Both of them are quite complicated for us right now. I mean, even the, the structure of our, our, our uh, team, or how should I say that the organization is quite, uh, it's revolving every two months, every three months, we're, we're restructuring, and okay, this, this is not working, so let's, let's try this type. So how, how would you uh, advise on balancing tech stack versus, we, yeah. we have an in-house, we have an in-house uh, tech team. Yeah, so you know, I'm going to take two steps back and and talk about us as a VC. And there are different kinds of VCs. So we we classify ourselves as uh, SBK Tech Ventures. So it's very important for us to uh, for any startup we fund to have a tech component. Having right. said that, I'm not sure if you um, in the earlier slides, you know, I was saying what is a startup? It has to be innovative, create value, the things we went through. So right. uh, and SM, sometimes people get confused between an SME and a startup. So SME is not necessarily a startup, right? Um, and SME could be just creating micro entrepreneurs and digitizing tech, uh, automated uh, or automating um, manual processes, right? right that's right. not a startup. So there's no innovation there. And But that's completely okay to be in that business because it, it has a huge potential in Bangladesh. So my question uh, to you would be, are you an SME or are you a startup? And if you are a startup, then where is your innovation besides automating um, you know, manual processes and giving tablets to ladies and, and the market linkages that you're doing is very important and needed, but a market linkage is not an innovative idea, right? We all know that needs to be happening. So I'd be very happy to, to spend more time with you and understand because that's a discovery that we would do together saying, who are you? What is your identity, right? And then right. to answer your point specifically on technology, um, we believe that any startup that is focused on impact, will an impact means masses. Impact means you don't solve for a few, you solve for millions. And you know, the technology, the only thing that technology does is helps you scale. It's, you know, right. and that's where we're saying that build on your technology. So invest in it now so you can take it forward. Most people begin with an app or a website and they do everything digitally. And that's where we're saying do it right from the start because you don't want to do a whole a revamp and rehaul your tech stack when you're scaling. That takes away a lot of time and com competitors can take advantage of that. So that's why it's, 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 technology is important, but then, you know, uh, I, I, I'm happy to sit with you, Vipasha, and figure out the, the self journey of who you are, what are you doing? And there's no right or no wrong here, right? It's just that first it's important to know yourself and then, then go to market. True. Um, just to add, add to that, um, I don't know if you, how you see that, but what we are trying to do is we are trying to introduce a voice-based um, uh, uh, financial services with our app, Fujog XYZ, which we launched uh, at the beginning of uh, first May um, uh, the last month. So um, so we have a, we have an investor uh, called Voice Bridge Bangladesh and uh, their mother company is Hishab.co and that's the company that actually sold their voice application to Google, I'm sure you know, um, uh, some years back. And uh, so, uh, and Zubair Bhai, he, he came in and he wants to do something in, in Bangladesh right now. So he's trying, he, he uh, developed on that app and now they've invested in um, iSocial and Sujo. And so we are trying to introduce voice-based um, financial services for um, these Kolani Shukormis. Our, we call them impact runners, uh, coincidentally. I know you coined that word <laughs> a few years back. So I'm on the, uh, our, our agents are called, the females are called Kolanis, the males Shukormis, and then we have the urban peri-urban uh, young professionals, and together they're called impact runners. So, um, oh. yeah, I'd really like to, I'd really like to, uh, you know, go further on the discussion and try to find out. Sure, I will, I will um, write my email address in the chat box. And then okay. any one of you, please feel free to email me. Please do not email me your deck. Send it to me in a video. <laughs> uh, one thing, and then I'm happy to give time and, uh, uh, and, and see where you are in the journey and, and if we can work together in any capacity. Sure, that happy. would be really great. Yes. Sure. Thank, thank sure. you, Appa. Thank you. Very welcome, Vipash. What's your favorite VDR platform? I'm just super curious. What, I mean, is there, do you have a favorite or are you a Google, Google Drive person? 
No, actually we have our own, um, that, but there is no favorite because we have, you know, 38 startups. You can imagine each one has their own. So there's yeah. no favorite. Choose one that works for you, Anu, and we're happy to, to look at that. Yeah. <laughs> but Google is free. So uh, it, 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 in the beginning, so that's what I would recommend to all startups. Hi, Sonia. Um, I'm Kenneth. Hi, I'm from MyCash. Um, yeah, we are a platform that actually um, based in Singapore and Malaysia that actually works um, targeted the migrant workers and our customers are mainly from Bangladesh. And actually we have, did in fact actually reach out to SDK, did reach out your team and it actually makes a lot of sense um, based on what you have presented, why your team asked us for certain things and it is it's really a very good presentation. Thank you there. Yeah, so, so the thing is that um, we have been trying to raise funds for quite some time um, most of the time it's unsuccessful, needless to say. But uh, the question is, there are certain VCs whereby we are actually very keen, um, keen to get them on board, where I guess they also show the same mutual interest. Um, the, the question is that the timing is not right. So for some VCs, you know, there could be some reasons um, which we may not understand why they are not ready to invest, though they are interested, or rather during the due diligence, they are okay, but it's not the right time. But the question is, how do we get, um, how do we carry on engaging such VCs without putting them off? Meaning to say is that, you know, we don't send the deck over to you over and over again. You would not be happy with that. But how do we continue, continuously engage such VCs? Um, because we know that maybe it's not now, but in the future, we hope that these VCs will be on board based on, you know, the certain visions that we have together. That's a, that's a very good question, uh, Kenneth, and I, I kind of know why you're asking that. <laughs> and we'll take that offline. But, you know, so just like a startup has a timeline, remember a VC also has a timeline, right? A VC doesn't have infinite money in their account to just at any time of the year write a check. So a VC also has, the VC also, so we also have to fundraise for our fund, right? So trying to align that mapping, and this is one of the things we also feel, right? That sometimes I honestly am going to tell you the truth that we've lost out on some very good startups because we weren't, we didn't have our funds ready, and the startup had its own cycle. So, so if you think that the fundraising is only a, a dilemma and a pain for the startups, let me tell you, I have the same pain you do, because you know we we are also fundraising our fund to right so. And, and we've lost quite a few in, in, in my four years, honestly speaking, there are some that I would have loved to invest in, but I couldn't because my fund was not ready or, uh, and the, the startup couldn't wait. So my, my advice, if I may give that to you, Ken, it is, is like um, try to stretch as much as possible, try to get a commitment from them say, and if you can somehow figure out a way where you can say, if you can commit, but I don't need the funds till a quarter later, then you're giving that VC some room, right? Because we all know that we will all raise. Let me work on the assumption that everybody here, including me, knows we will raise. It's just a matter of time. So then if you can give that comfort to a VC that, look, if you're serious, give me a term sheet and tell me that you will have a staggered payment because we understand you need to raise funds. But you know the VC has to commit to that. So the term sheet is a legally binding uh, make it legally binding so that they don't kind of throw you off. But that's the best advice, if I can be very honest, that I can give because I know this is a dilemma. I face it myself too. You're not, not alone, let me tell you this. And I think I, I, I know about my cash. I think you're doing phenomenally well. Thank you so much, Sonia. Appreciate sure. it. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, hi Sonia. Uh, Sorry, hello. someone else wanted to, wanted to go? Can I, can Subrata. I go? Subrata, go ahead. Okay, well, thanks, thanks, Rahul. Uh, hi, Sonia. Uh, my name is Shubroto. Uh, I have an agritech startup called Halo Social Enterprises. I had the opportunity to interact with you, you and also your team. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm caught up in this uh, discussion between SME and startup. And at times I feel like that uh, what I'm doing is, is that's what matters to me. Whether you call me a startup, whether you call me an SME, it doesn't really matter. So what, I essentially, what we essentially do is that we sell uh, uh, curated farming inputs like seeds, fertilizers, et cetera, et cetera. And the innovation that we bring into this space is by curating, like we're bringing in multiple things uh, that farmers need. 
that's uh, one piece and the other piece is that we also bring in the advisory and credit facility that's that's what farmers need they need advice and they need also credit facility to access those good quality inputs and uh, i mean if i draw a comparison with uh, some of the indian uh, input e-commerce businesses like agrostar uh, gramophone and then there is a big one called big hut so uh, they are using a, they are they kind of a pure e-commerce uh, kind of input e-commerce business but in bangladesh context we realize the kind of segment that we are trying to serve they are not tech savvy and we need an intermediary in between so we have uh, we are appointing agents like just like vipasha uh, his company her company is doing so we have these agents the agents basically bridge the gap between the company and the farm and we are primarily building the technology uh, for the agents so they will basically do their operations instead of doing manually they will do it digitally and on by using the agents we'll also try to bridge, bridge the gap let's say for example we want to provide digitized advisory like tech based advisory like we get some information image from the farmer we take it into the app and that app comes back and we do data analysis uh, we do expert consultation we reach out to the farmer over call center so so everything is built on this platform so the core innovation in this piece is this aggregation and then also adding on advisory and credit facility and without this agent this whole model will collapse so and uh, if i look at it from other point of view the model can work without a tech intervention but the model will really become scalable if we really bring in technology uh, to make the job easier for the agent and also bring in information and data uh, uh, from the farmers analyze it and use it for our better decision making giving better offers to the farmers now so uh, so this is what we we do and now i'm caught up whenever i'm presenting to an angel or a local vc in bangladesh even also i have spoken to some of the vcs outside of bangladesh so i'm always getting this feedback that uh, most of the time i'm getting this feedback that this is not scalable uh, uh, where is the deep tech into it why don't you have deep tech so then i'm trying to refer it like if this thing is working in india and companies like agrostar they have gone to scale they have raised so much of vc capital why is it a problem with when it comes to bangladesh and us and uh, if i let's say the examples that i was giving like agrostar gramophone and big hat these are like pure e-commerce businesses without using any agent there is a company called boombox in india who are who are supplying white goods uh, to the rural consumers by using an agent model so so essentially what i understand is by using the agent model the business can scale but i'm not trying to figure out like where it is not coming together uh, like innovation impact and technology where it is not it is not coming together with investors am i talking to the right people or Uh, or, or am I not talking talking to the right people? Um, thank you, Shubhato. I I I I hear you, and um, you know, specifically in a country like ours, you cannot expect technology to solve the problem from the beginning, right? So if I were to speak, uh, sit with you, and do have a deeper conversation, I would say that use first your business model needs to work. So build your cookie cutter. so once you have a cookie cutter you can make 100 cookies because you know you have the cutter and you don't need technology to build your cookie cutter you need technology to scale so right. so if you build your cookie cutter and you can build you know make 50 cookies and sell and then you say now when i want to make 5 million cookies i need technology that's completely respectable and that's understandable because if in your business solution you do not require technology in the beginning why invest in it just you don't need to look cool right that that's not needed so uh, an astute investor will say you you sh- show them the dream what what we're really doing is a storytelling when you're sitting with an investor you're you're what you're really doing is telling a story and a story that is believable and the investor should should believe your story that's all you're doing so when you talk mm-hmm. to investors don't just talk it in this way that first you know even our customers and our farmers they're not used to technology right so you can't just just go and say it's going to be a, a, like here's a sophisticated solution with your problem come and find me you don't want to be that right so remember what i said in the beginning technology only helps when you scale but if you're going to try your solution out and you don't and in your model you don't need technology to try it out first you need the customer behavior the customer acceptance and then you change that gradually because with covid one of the things that happened was that the digital transformation was accelerated what bangladesh would not have been so transformed digitally had we not had covid overnight you know what happened schools health fintech everything did well right so the the acceptance of technology has increased the country is doing well people have disposable income to spend on things that they wouldn't have earlier so for my advice to you would be i have definitely heard of bhalo 
Um, that's right. If you're from Bhalo, right? Right, yes. right, right. Yeah. Nick has briefed me and I think I like your business plan, but I'm saying take it in baby steps and walk the investor through three parts of your dream or your story. Mm -hmm. Part one is, is testing my solution. Part two is going to market and seeing if there is traction. Part three is layering in technology because technology only helps you scale. You do not need to have technology when you're testing a product market fit. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunepa. That was really helpful. Sure, my pleasure. Hi, Sonia. This is uh, Nishant from Fundfina. Um, so uh, we um, are India-based embedded finance platform. Um, the end goal is to build the best uh, MSME banking account. Uh, we have served almost uh, 350,000 MSME till date. Uh, we have a lot of... Uh, uh, data indices as well, which is almost like credit score for MSMEs that we have built. And um, that we would have done almost for a million MSMEs till date. So uh, uh, good traction. Now, of course, we are um, planning to launch in, in Bangladesh. Uh, my question is pretty much, should we, uh, of course, we are doing a local entity in Bangladesh. Are we raising money for that local entity or fund fina as a whole? So as a VC, what would you prefer? Um, that's a trick question. <laughs> um, so, you know, as a VC, no VC has any, um, you know, apart from our investment thesis of what guides us, right? That is in our investment documents. We are open to, to ways of working together. So what you're doing is very interesting. We've just funded a, a local um, fintech startup that was our last funded one. It's called Dana, D-A-N-A. And they do digital lending, alternative credit scores, and they're learning mach through machine learning. And they're also looking at embedded finance, right? So we, I, I think that's the future. And MSME, as we know, is, is, you know, is the future because they're the missing middle, too, too small for a MFI and too big for a commercial bank. They have a $20 billion lending gap in Bangladesh. So what you're doing is, is really helping that solve that problem. Um, and if I, I, I honestly would have to have a deeper conversation with you to kind of understand how to answer your question. And I'm happy to do that. I'm just sending my email to all of sure. you um, so that we can. So there's, if you are addressing a problem in Bangladesh that can, you know, MSME is masses by all means, we'd be definitely happy to look at it. And, and your, your company is in India. Company is registered in India. We have a uh, lot of our data scientists in UK. So we are really uh, cross border. In fact, one of our, uh, two of our folks also sits in US. They are now scientists. So, um, so we, uh, for whatever the reason, getting the best talent pool, we are multinational from day one. Um, uh, and, but in terms of, Actually, where we get the revenues, it is India's. That is where we get most of the revenue. Plan is definitely Bangladesh and selected North African country in near future. So would you have a registered entity in Bangladesh? In the process of, we are doing uh, stacking of the carts to set up the local entity and uh, hire local folks. Okay, sure. Happy to connect um, and, and have a... A, more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation so I understand. Sure. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sonia. Thank you. Hey, Sonia, I think Mark from Nampia Farmers had a question uh, in the chat. It's regarding evaluation uh, of the startups and probably can't go in uh, too deep into this, but uh, what would be some general maybe uh, pointers on how you um, value your startups? Thank you for that question. So there are multiple ways you can do evaluation. The most traditional way is the EBITDA, which I don't expect startups to do because you know you're a startup, you don't have you don't have revenue and expense and profit. So mostly the ones we do are doing it on uh, DCF, which is discounted cash flow. But the one that I like for startups and I push that is your your potential. What is your potential in five years from now? What do you think your value will be? 
Because you know, if you are doing a DCF or a traditional EBITDA model, you are a startup, you don't have that kind of number. So that's where you as a startup need to convince an investor that look, five years from now, this is where I can be. And that's what you need to bet on. So use your projected financials. So what, when you do uh, planning, do a five-year plan, a revenue expense and basic, because we don't expect you to you know, be, be financial experts when you do the valuation, we will do our own. Our team will look at the numbers and do our own valuation. But for you, instead of spending too much time, I'd say do a five-year business projection and say um, that this is where I will be. My value today is what I will be five years from now. That's the easiest one that you can begin the dialogue with and then the VC will come in and step in. But the valuation that, that works for us, a lot of startups have come to us with that and we're happy to move forward with that. If, if that answers the question. Let me see the chat if, if, that, was, uh, if that answered the question. I have a general question for you, Sonia. This is regarding intellectual property and crossing over to Bangladesh. I've got, I've got IP, it's protected. Um, our tech stack is ph phenomenal. The people on our tech team are phenom phenomenal. But crossing over to Bangladesh, we, we're going to have this challenge of finding local partners and dealing with lawyers that are not having conflict of interest with people that we want to partner with. Um, navigating this legal dilemma through partnerships, um, I, I feel is going to be our greatest challenge. Um, also navigating regulatory, government, government um, approvals of cryptocurrency and blockchain. This is something that I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about. I know things are, are moving in, in, the, in the digital way and some countries are more ahead than others. Do you know of any sandbox rules or, or do we need to talk directly with the government or how, how do you navigate this? You as a VC, I'm sure you have tech that's coming in, not just going out. Yeah, incidentally, yesterday I was actually speaking with a startup uh, based in the Middle East that wants to come into Bangladesh with cryptocurrency and blockchain, something very similar. And you know, so we we are we are um, as a VC, we are regulated by the Securities Exchange Commission. We work very closely with their office, and that's the office that would need to give you that exception to do a project in Bangladesh with crypto. Crypto is still not allowed, right? We are happy to help you with that, but but you know, I think um, we and I'll be very happy to personally. Uh, uh, Anu, I know we've caught up on WhatsApp to help you with the legal and, and all. It's in Bangladesh, unfortunately, although it's only 160 million people, it's a lot of people, but we know enough people amongst ourselves to get to get you covered if you were to start here and yeah. get you the right people who don't mess it up for you. So don't worry about that. Let's talk offline. We have our meeting set up, right? So we'll take it forward there and then connecting you to the right people so you can roll and you, there will be hurdles. Let me please prepare all of you as you come into this market. That's why we're an emerging economy. While there is huge potential, there will be lots of obstacles. But remember, all of you are resilient. All of you are persistent. You will knock them off one at a time. And I'll help you do that. Amazing. I'm ready to do it. Thank you. Sure. Any final questions for Sonia? If not, I will ask one question. <laughs> It should be easy, Mehmet. Don't go hard on me now. <laughs> this is the easiest one to, to, to wrap it up. So you mentioned that when you're uh, looking at uh, uh, new teams, the first thing you look at is the person or the you know the team. Uh, I'm just uh, curious uh, because I've heard this uh, from other VCs uh, as well that the team is the most important thing, the determining factor in the end when things get tough. Um, whether you have a, a specific uh, methodology. Uh, is it just the gut feeling, which usually is, I guess, uh, <laughs> most of the time? I don't know. Uh, not everyone is a seasoned uh, investor, you know, ass assess the person when they walk in to see how resilient uh, they are. Um, and the, the reason I'm asking this question is, uh, you know, just to give some maybe advice to our founders uh, when they start engaging the investors, not obviously to fake uh, resilience when they're not, but uh, just to make sure that, you know, they don't give the wrong uh, impression whether there's some practical uh, tips in that conversation. I'm glad you asked me because I, I sh next time I'll remember to put it on my slide deck. There are three things I look for and my team also, I think we've agreed that when somebody comes in or a team or startup, we look for three things, right? Firstly, we want to see a positive attitude. 
if you have if you are not a positive person you're not going to be able to sustain the journey of a startup secondly we want to see a lot of smiles we don't want to see frowning right so it's a very small thing but it it, it adds and last but not the least is that it's it's very important for us that the inner balance of the person and i i don't know how best to explain this but when you are presenting there we will question you we will poke you we will challenge you are you professional enough to take it well to take it gracefully take criticism gracefully if you can do all these three that you are a very positive person you are smiling and you can take criticism as as constructive and move forward these are these are things that are that we look for in founders right thank you sonia thank you very much for today it was a wonderful session and you know thank you for connecting with our teams offline as well that will bring a lot of value uh, always uh, good having you here and uh, looking forward to uh, collaborating with you more sdg impact accelerator so will that uh, with that uh, we're going to uh, finalize today uh, if you have any final uh, words for the teams uh, you know we can finish with that no thank you very much for listening in it it was i enjoyed it more than most of you i'm sure because i love interacting with startup founders and um, i'm looking forward to meeting you online or if you're not in bangladesh in person whichever way we can it, um i wish you the best of luck and as i said earlier you couldn't have been in a better time than now so go get them we'll watch out for you good luck thank you thank you apa 